In 1860, David Wyrick, he's a guy who surveyed the Newark earthworks. He was digging into a mound near those earthworks and he found a wooden coffin made of oak. They opened up the coffin and found a skeleton of a man holding a little box. It was about 8.10 inches in size. The box had been cemented shut here. This, by the way, is sitting in Ohio. Well, he opened up the box and he found a little man inside, a little black stone. They took it to scholars and they looked at it. The man seems to be carrying something and there's writing here. At first, they couldn't recognize. The writing is, they thought in 1860, some sort of Hebrew. Well, finally, about 20 years later, they found some rabbis living in the area and the rabbis looked at that and they could read it. They said it was an old, old kind of block Hebrew, uh, block Hebrew, and it was a rendition of the Ten Commandments. Now, this is another piece. Block Hebrew, they said they'd never seen anything like it. Mainstream archeologists at the time called this a hoax. But then in 1900, or just about after 1900, in Israel, they found the same block style Hebrew writing. Mainstream archaeologists still dismissed the findings. They found it in Israel and they found it in Ohio. But there was another stone that they found that they couldn't argue. This is the Bat Creek Stone. It was found during the course of an official Smithsonian evacuation. The Smithsonian didn't understand the, uh, uh, the meaning of the writing on the stone. They thought it was Cherokee since it came from Cherokee country. They didn't realize that it's actually Hebrew. They had published this originally upside down. They threw it in a box at the bottom of the Smithsonian, put it in the basement. Many years later, a scholar took it out of the box, looked at it, and went, oh my gosh, it's upside down. It's Phoenician, ancient Hebrew. So what's going on here? What is that about? Where is that history? I'll show you in a few minutes and we're going to have a conversation and I'm going to show you some more things that the Smithsonian science, government, commerce colluded to erase. By the way, I want to thank the directors of the documentary Lost Civilizations of North America for bringing these stories to my attention. I was blown away. To find more, visit the website lostcivilizationdvd.com. Here's the thing we should be asking ourselves. I don't know the story of these. Do you know, did you know that? Do you live in Ohio and did you know that? Why not? Were the American Indians wronged? Yes, yes. And that's what we focus on in America, is we were bad to the American Indians. Forget about it, it's in the past. The question should be the ones that the founders asked. Who are they? What knowledge do they have? Can you imagine the difference we would have now if we would put our differences aside and put our past in the past and concentrate on today and say, let's learn from each other. What do you have? What is that? What is that? When we come back, I'm going to be joined by uh, uh, P Peter Lilbach, who is, oh, I've told you before, um, is one of my favorite authors. He's going to talk to me a little bit about the founders here. And I'm also going to show you some documents that show how that history has been erased. Next. This is the Smithsonian Annual Report, um, 1882, 1883. This is John Wesley um, Howell. This is an original copy. Um, John Wesley Howell in 1789. Again, this is, uh, this is the, I'm sorry, Powell. This is the director um, of uh, the Bureau of Ethnology at the Smithsonian Institute. He said this. Um, artifacts found prior to Christopher Columbus's arrival would be considered illegitimate by the Smithsonian. Um, only the savage Indian culture would be observed and this created the artificial bar barrier to science. Only the savage. Science was colluding with government because of commerce and religion was involved. Now, why do I tell you all this stuff? Not because I'm an Indian expert or anything else. You've got to do your own homework. I, I just found out about this stuff. I'm amazed by it. I don't know what the answer is on this. The reason why I bring it up is the stock is not bad. The soup went bad, but the stock is not. Peter Lilbach, Dr. Peter Lilbach, 
How are you, sir? Good to see you. This is, a, this is a book that needs to be owned by every American. Every single American should have this book in their home. It's called Sacred Fire. This, these are the words of George Washington, and it takes history absolutely apart. Apart. Not on somebody's opinion, but on their own words, on his words. Peter, I want to go to you and talk to you a little bit about, again, the stock. George Washington had a good relationship. Our founders had a good relationship with the Native Americans. Right? There's no question about that. When they came to America, they realized they could not survive without a close relationship with the Indian people. The greatest story, for example, is the pilgrims who are blown off course. 800 miles out of their destination in Virginia, they're in Massachusetts, they land on ground, and they're in the middle of nowhere, no government. They make the Mayflower Compact, mm -hmm. so they have government when they land. Mm -hmm. And there's no Native Americans there because a plague had gone through, but one person shows up. He happens to be a Native American that knew English. He'd actually been taken captive to England. He'd learned English. He'd gotten his freedom. He came back. His people were gone. The white settlers are there all of a sudden, and he meets them, and he says, welcome. He speaks English. They couldn't believe it. The providence of that moment is extraordinary. They needed help and there was a person there to help them That's and he was a Native American right. and that creates Massachusetts. All right, do I have time for one more story real quick? No? Okay, hang on because I want to come back and talk about um, I want to talk about William Penn because William Penn said something when he was working with the Indians that is critical to understand the truth I think about America and we'll do that next. Um, the history the history that has been erased in our nation, in particular with the Native Americans, happened because it didn't fit the story they created, Manifest Destiny. It only works when Indians were savages, and they had to have savages for commerce and government to expand. The ancient artifacts prove otherwise. Why aren't we looking into those? Peter Lilback is the president of Providence Forum and the author of George Washington's Sacred Fire. Okay, Peter. Um, I think a great place for, for Americans to understand the truth about Americans and Native Americans and African Americans, all of it, it comes from William Penn. Tell the story. Great story. Philadelphia, the great founding city of the United States, that's where government began, it was founded by William Penn. He wanted a city without walls. And he determined that he would do it by making a constant commitment to justice and ethics with the Native Americans. There never was an Indian war with William Penn. Mm. And there's a wonderful treaty that still exists that describes the commitment they made. And it says this, there are good people and bad people among all people. There are good and bad Indians. There are good and bad Christians. That's what he called them in Philadelphia. And he said, we must come together so that we will address these problems that will come with respect and by communication, affirming America. the good. That's where we need to be. There are good among us and bad among us. There are good Americans, bad Americans. There's good parts of America. There are bad parts of America in the American story. We've got to come together, come together as the good people, stand together and guard against the bad so we can live in a country without walls. Peter, thank you very much.